In the movie Reign of Fire, America and Britain are back for World War III. This time, they're up against dragons. Nazi dragons? No, just dragons, but scary nonetheless. The year is 2020, and in this alternate reality, the world wasn't plagued by a viral misfortune, but a fire-breathing one. At some point in the early 21st century, we woke up a violent species of fire-breathing lizards our ancestors called dragons. What we thought was a myth turned into a horrifying reality. Vast numbers of these deadly flying reptiles overwhelmed every attempt to defeat them, all but annihilating our species. This is a story told by the movie which focuses on humanity's attempt to defeat the dragons in a post-apocalyptic future where we lost the initial fight but have learned much about our foe and have a new angle of attack. However, I'm not sold on the premise we'd lose round one against the dragons. For that reason, I'm going to divide this analysis into two parts. In this video from Strange Thoughts, we're going to cover how to beat the dragons from Reign of Fire with modern weaponry. We'll discuss how we can actually avoid the film's dystopian future by using today's best military minds deadliest weapons and cutting edge technology. Then, in a second video, we'll explore what options we have to beat the dragons assuming we lost round one. We'll use a vital discovery about the dragon's biology, primitive weapons, and sheer will to live to ensure our species once again reigns supreme. However, before we start our dragon slaying quest, hit the like and subscribe button as it really helps me make more videos. And do it now, because even if we somehow beat this prehistoric race, most of you will die in the process, long before the victory parade down the charred streets of New York City. Without further ado, let's get started. The movie begins by showing us an entry to construction sites was somewhat lax in the early 2000s. Quinn, our main character, is shown as a small boy visiting his mother who's working on the latest addition to London's metro, Deep Underground. In the initial dialogue, we get some drama about how he has dreams, but they have no money to fulfill those dreams. This heartfelt moment is interrupted by a worker who informs them the tunnel crews hit a wall and there's a void behind it. Why don't you go inside and have a wee look? Nothing good ever follows someone asking you to check out a void, but young Quinn is curious. He stumbles into the lair of a giant dragon whose peaceful slumber was interrupted by some noisy drilling equipment. The dragon then chases Quinn and his mum out of the tunnel, killing her along the way. Cutting to present day, Quinn recounts how he was the sole survivor of humanity's first encounter with the dragons and lived on to see them overtake humans as the dominant species on planet Earth. A montage of newspaper clippings and early broadcasts help him explain how they reproduce quickly, overpowering our earliest attempts to defeat them. After all else failed, we decide to nuke them, because of course we did. The nuke is always the final option. First we send the marines, then we hit it with missiles, then we say f*** it, let's nuke them. Unfortunately for us, the nukes did more harm to the humans than the dragons they targeted. When nuclear winter sent in, what was left of the human race faced the additional threats of starvation and radiation that led to the nightmarish setting of the film. Now, being the seasoned military tactic that I'm not, let me share how the world leaders might have acted in a way that wouldn't have ravaged our planet for years to come. A lot hinges on the initial response. The first few weeks when the dragons are at their lowest numbers are crucial to us getting the upper hand. So, what would a proper response look like? Let's look at this from a timeline perspective, starting on the day young Quinn finds the male dragon. On day zero, we'll call it D-Day, the male dragon emerges from the tunnel of London along with hundreds of female dragons. Within hours, they turn London to ash and start their push into the countryside. While F-35s from nearby bases like RF Marhem will engage the dragons and conceivably knock a few out of the sky, they'll be significantly outnumbered. Their attacks will also lead the dragons back to the Air Force bases where the flying beasts will begin crippling the UK's military forces. While England will put up a good fight, they won't have much of a chance. Their unfortunate location in the epicenter of Dragonville means they won't have time to mobilize their forces against the swarms of dragons barbecuing their country. While this is happening, a massive wave of images and videos of the London dragon attack will flood the internet. The sheer amount of high quality footage will convince everyone, save some flat earthers, that these mythical beasts are for real. Within hours, world leaders will be convinced of the threat not only due to what they see in London, but also the dragons start emerging from hibernation in their own countries. They'll start enacting national emergency plans and mobilizing their militaries. I'm in the US, so I'm going to talk specifically about our plans, but I assume most world armies would do something similar. The United States Defense Readiness Condition, also known as DEFCON, would provide a basis for America's response. The system has five levels that pretty much take us from hunky-dory to blowing our nuclear load all over the world. In addition to nukes, it establishes the foundation for more detailed plans specific to each part of the government and 
branch of our armed forces. It's safe to say that by the end of D-Day, the US will be at DEFCON 1. This means all VIPs and hardened underground facilities in each branch of the military at its highest alert status. We'll be in the process of activating reserves, recalling deployed forces, and have likely declared martial law. By the end of D-Day Plus One, we'll have also secured the best minds in academics and private industry. I'm talking about people like Elon Musk, Bob Lazar, and the scientists from Armageddon. This is Dr. Ronald Quincy from Research, pretty much the smartest man on the planet. You might want to listen to him. We may even bring in Harry Stamper in case we need to drill through this problem. All they gotta do is drill. That's it. Together with our military tacticians, these individuals will start looking at the weapons at our disposal and how best to use them against this dragonic threat. Everything will be on the table. Now, before we get to the weapons and tactics, we need to first discuss the dragons themselves. Brace yourself, cause we're about to get real nerdy. Nerd alert. If you want to get technical, what's depicted in the movie isn't dragons, but rather wyverns. The main difference being that while dragons have four legs, wyverns only have two. The other two limbs are a wing-foot hybrid, but I'm just going to call them dragons because it sounds way cooler. The movie explains how they evolved along with the dinosaurs until they eventually wiped them out. With no dino food left, they went into hibernation waiting for a new food supply, which just so happens to be us. Like the dinosaurs, we're an inferior species and two resources. Specs. First, they're extremely effective hunters. Most notable is their fire breath. It is created when two glands of the mouth secrete substances that when combined form a natural napalm. This fire breath can reach temperatures of 2000 degrees, which is pretty deadly for almost anything living on our planet. As far as size, the females are at least three times longer than the helicopter seen in the movie in Augusta Westland 109. That would put a female at roughly 100 feet in length. For width, the female looks about 10 times wider than the helicopter's fuselage. This would mean a wingspan of at least 50 feet. While large, they're incredibly nimble in the air. The skies become their domain because of their insane three-dimensional maneuverability. They can make tight turns, fly extremely low, and go from an 180 mile per hour dive to a complete stop in seconds. We can infer their speed from the way a female dragon catches up to the AW-109 in this scene. The helicopter itself has a top speed of around 170 miles per hour so they can at least fly this fast. Their bodies are armored with scales resistant to small arms fire and the only soft spot is their underbelly. However, it's not their durability, maneuverability, or fire breath that makes them the superior species. It's the fact that they f**k like rabbits and grow faster than a xenomorph overdosing on growth hormone. According to the movie, they quickly grew in numbers until there were millions of them turning the world to ash. It's discovered later that they actually reproduce similar to reptiles and that the females lay the eggs and the males fertilize them. However, unlike other reptiles, there is only one male dragon who fertilizes all the eggs. While their means of propagation allows them to reproduce quickly, it is also a major weakness. By taking out one male, you can decimate their species. Okay, so now that we know about the dragons, it's time to figure out how to beat them. The first tactic that comes to mind for most is air-to-air -air combat. Whether it's the F-22, F-15, or any other modern fighter, our ability to feed the dragon in aerial combat comes down to stealth, armament, guidance systems, and tactics. The dragons in this movie use the visible light spectrum, smell, and sound for hunting. The film mentions how their vision is far superior to our own, allowing them to see extremely well well both day and night. However, current fighter jets have the ability to attack targets from 20 nautical miles and beyond. This would feasibly put us out of the range of the dragon's vision, especially in low visibility conditions. As far as stealth is concerned, the range of our weapons would render us invisible right up until a hypersonic missile delivered its high explosive payload. Speaking of missiles, let's talk about how our current armament and guidance systems would fare against this prehistoric bogey. Air-to-air -air missiles like the AIM-120 AMRAAM have an operational range of 40 nautical miles, travel at Mach 4, and have a 60 plus percent kill probability against modern adversaries. While the Dragon may have the advantage of tougher armor relative to modern fighters, it will have the disadvantage of not noticing the missile until it's too late. This means other factors that increase kill probability, such as attack vector, speed of the missile, and speed of the target will all be skewed in the missile's favor. Oh, and dragons don't have parachutes. I think it's safe to say that a dragon playing chicken with a Raytheon AIM-120 is gonna have a bad day.
day. That said, the missile is only as good as its guidance system. Most air-to-air -air munitions rely on either radar or infrared targeting. While Nerd Nation seems divided on whether IR could pick up a dragon's heat signature, six out of 10 core experts agree its body would give off a large enough radar signal for a missile to lock on. Even if the dragon's scales did obscure the radar, there are other options. Missiles like the AIM-120 can use electro-optical imaging to find their target. These guidance systems use a combination of electronics and optics to generate, detect, and measure radiation in the optical spectrum. This would put us on par or better off as far as visual abilities versus the dragons. Between these three guidance systems and whatever our scientists are cooking up in Area 51, we'd be able to mop the floor on a one-on-one -on -one or even six-to-one basis given we're far enough away and properly armed. But let's say we want to go top gun all over their asses. Traditional dogfighting with pilots like Iceman and Maverick. F-22s and other modern attack aircraft are equipped with close-range weapons like the internally mounted M61A2 Vulcan rotary cannon. This cannon fires 120mm armor-piercing shells per second. If the dragon's hide was too tough for these rounds, we could bring some A-10s out to play. While designed specifically for the anti-tank role, their 30mm Avenger rotary cannons can be turned to the sky. The burp of 65 depleted uranium shells a second would turn a deadly swarm of dragons into a misty red cloud. However, while fun to think about, dogfighting isn't the best strategy. The considerable advantage that comes from beyond visual range missiles would be eliminated. We'd be up against a foe that while not as fast, is superior in just about every other facet of maneuverability. Combat tactics like the high yo-yo and flat scissors are meant for fighting other aircraft, not dragons. As far as strategies and tactics, our best bet would be to stay far away and use our missiles. In addition to manned aircraft, UAVs like the Predator and Reaper could be employed to not only attack, but also monitor the swarms of dragons wreaking havoc on the country. However, these large drones would not be the only pilotless vehicles in the sky. A drone swarm attack like the one in the movie Angel Has Fallen could be another strategy for either offensive or defensive operations. Hundreds of drones ranging in size from 3 feet to mere inches could be used in coordinated attacks against a single or large group of dragons. In addition to kamikaze drones armed with explosives, these drones could carry other more experimental types of armament. Now, I'm an idea guy, so don't ask me how the following would be implemented, but here's what I'm thinking. If explosives didn't work, we could arm the drones with some type of taser-like equivalent that would latch itself onto the dragon's wings. Similar to how a taser incapacitates a human ability to move by disrupting nerve cells, the motor neurons that control a dragon's wings could be rendered ineffective, thus causing them to fall to their death. We could literally make it rain dragons. But let's talk about how we could beat the dragons from the ground to defend strategic infrastructure. Just like aircraft, we'd be able to deploy missiles with effective guidance systems onto vehicles, ships, and soldiers. We'd supplement these missile systems with weapons like the XM914 30mm auto cannon with airburst rounds. A number of these mounted on Bradley linebackers would be just one one of many additional layers backing up our missile shield. Finally, as this is World War III, we bring out the latest tech from our secret labs. It's not hard to imagine we have some workable directed energy weapons. Instead of incinerating missiles, these lasers could be reprogrammed to slice and dice dragon wings. While we wouldn't have many of them, we could position the ones that we do have around the most important facilities. Between our air-to-air -air weapons and ground offenses, we'd easily defeat the initial wave of dragons. One squadron of 12 F-22s armed with six missiles each could take down 40 dragons, even with a reduced kill probability of 50%. Here's the thing though, we're not dealing with tens of dragons, hundreds of dragons, or even thousands of dragons. While Quinn was probably being a little hyperbolic when he said there were millions of dragons, we can assume there were a lot of them, too many for our traditional military options. You're running out of missiles, sir. We're just not causing enough damage. So inevitably we go to our WMDs. Snoop the bastards. This would include both non-nuclear methods like carpet bombing various dragon lairs, as well as the nuclear option. If we did go nuclear, it would likely be tactical weapons detonated near large concentrations of dragons. However, unless we're able to effectively kill the male, which is likely hiding deep underground and only coming out when necessary, we're still not going to put a dent in their ever-growing population. We'd essentially arrive at a fork in the road for our species. If we learned how the dragons reproduced early enough, we'd have 
have a chance. Given our scientists figured this out, the world's combined military might would be focused towards seeking out and destroying the single male dragon. The cost would be high, but humanity would prevail. We'd have a celebration arrival Independence Day, which would no longer be known as an American holiday, but as the day when the world declared in one voice, we will not go quietly into the night. And if we find out too late, well, I think the movie paints a pretty accurate picture of what would ensue. Humanity would be reduced to just a few survivors due to the dragon's wrath and the poor decisions of our nation's leaders. But not all hope is lost. In the next video, we'll see how human ingenuity, primitive weapons, and knowledge of the dragon's biological flaw can bring an end to the reign of fire. That said, I hope you liked this video about how to beat dragons with our current day armed forces. Check out the comments below for all I got wrong about military weapons weapons and tactics, and let me know if you have any other ideas for using our modern weaponry against these prehistoric predators. I'll leave you with one final question. Who would you put your money on in a one-on-one -on -one winner takes all dogfight against the single male dragon? Captain Pete Mitchell or Captain Stephen Hiller? My money's on Big Willie. That's what I call a close encounter.